Hey, so what's up? Welcome back to the Clinical Trials Guru.com. Again, it's the Clinical Trials Guru. Thanks to all the Guru Nations and all the supporters out there. So I've been doing as I'm building my CRO. Actually, it's myself and I have a team of people. As we've been building our CRO this year in 2016, remember we have still uh, are very involved, actively involved in managing clinical research sites, uh, helping other research sites get studies, find physicians, get patients, create source documents. We also have the CRA training. There's a lot going on, but we've started this CRO because we believe we have the infrastructure in place to be able to do a very good job. And this video is going to sort of show the inner workings of a CRO. So it's going to demystify what a CRO actually is. I know besides the obvious research sites out there and future CRAs or current CRAs, that are fans of the uh, show and, and of the videos. Uh, I also realized that I have a lot of pharmaceutical sponsors and biotech companies watching, and especially some of the biotech companies, they may have never gone through a clinical trial. Maybe they're just an early stage biotech company doing preclinical work, and they're thinking of starting a clinical trial on one of their compounds. So they may be wondering, hey, what's a CRO? So I wanted to be able to not only demystify this for them, but for anyone out there who's interested. This is my slide presentation for our CRO services. I imagine this will change a lot over the years. Um, but this is what we have created now. It essentially outlines not only the typical and, and more traditional CRO services and functions, but uh, it, it highlights some key factors which I think differentiate us from the competition. So with that being said, and remember, keep it in mind, we've been running research sites and we've been training PIs and sites um, and everything that that entails for the last decade. So we believe we have the infrastructure in place to be able to properly execute this strategy. Okay, so uh, here we go. So the, the CRO is called DSCS. That's my CRO. There's our logo there. On time and under budget, right? So we manage every clinical project and most CROs do the same thing. They're, this is what's called full service CROs. So they manage the clinical trial from concept to final report, all right now sponsors lately have been focusing on rare diseases and orphan drugs and we feel like that's our niche as well um, because as you'll see we'll get into our strategy and, and, and you'll see why that makes sense but just know that at its most basic level a CRO is a company that is hired by a pharmaceutical sponsor to take over and manage the clinical trials, all right? Maybe it's just one clinical trial, maybe it's a dozen. Sometimes sponsors have exclusive agreements with CROs where they'll manage all their trials. Sometimes it's just one trial. Um, and that means everything from site selection, protocol development, and we're gonna get into a lot of that stuff, all the way up to uh, FDA reporting and even sometimes marketing of the approved product. Okay, so we're going to get into some of that here. So we are located in Southern California. We're a full service CRO. We differentiate ourselves with our patient recruitment strategy. So like I said, a lot of sponsors have been focusing on rare diseases, orphan diseases, and this is where we want to get our niche. Okay, so these are typically studies that are difficult to recruit for. And we know because remember, we're on the other side of this as site owners. And we run sites and, and we see these studies coming in it and we see the enrollment projections and we see the enrollment numbers, uh, the actual enrollment numbers versus the enrollment projections that we're seeing are often very, two very different numbers. And that's the problem with the majority of clinical trials is they're rarely on time and they're always over budget. And the lowest common denominator, the reason 
why this occurs, as most in the industry would agree with, is lack of patient recruitment, right? So we decided, well, what a good idea to launch a CRO with uh, beginning with the end in mind. We're going to solve the recruitment problem, right? And we're going to show you how we do that. Um, so most CROs try to do this. Um, however, they're limited because most CROs, their selling point is they have a network uh, they have a database of physicians or of research sites that they've worked with in the past. These are usually experienced research sites. Um, so these are sites that the CRO has worked with before and most likely to work with again, depending on the therapeutic indication. Sometimes they need to go out and find new sites. Uh, in our case, we start with the physicians, whether they do research or not the physicians that actually see the patient population and we reverse engineer the whole study to them, all right? And we're gonna get into that. So the problem with most studies, low recruitment rates, the root of the problem is site selection and PI recruitment. So people always talk about how do we solve the patient recruitment problem, you know? And the answer is simple, recruit more patients, all right? Now, when you actually look into that, how to do that, uh, you start coming up with solutions or possible solutions. And what we've discovered is that finding the PIs, finding the physicians who already treat the target population of the study, whether they do research or not, we need those patients in the trial, right? And the problem with research is that the physicians that have a lot of patients in their private practice, typically don't do clinical research because they're too busy running their practice. And the physicians that do conduct clinical trials typically don't have a large database because they're spending most of their time running their research clinics. So it's sort of like a catch-22, right? So using our experience from the past decade of running sites, setting up sites from an idea to an actual full-fledged, fully operational, fully functional research site, grossing several million dollars a year. I mean, this is what we've done the, over the past decade. So we know we can do that with just about any physician who's willing to give research a try. Okay, so our business development team will find the physicians across the country who have these patient populations, we're going to talk to them, we're going to set up meetings, we're going to educate them on research, we're going to educate them on how clinic, private clinical research sites are ran and operated, we're going to show them success stories that we've had in the past with our clients and our sites, and we're going to tell them that if they want, we can do the same for them, all right? And they should start with this study because it's a perfect fit for them, whatever that study might be. So unlike traditional SMO models, this, a lot of you might be listening and thinking, okay, this sounds a lot like the site management organizations, which got a bad reputation in the 90s and early 2000s. This is not the case. We don't, the sites that we find as a CRO, we do not take equity in those sites, okay? Now we do own some sites, we do have equity in some sites, and those sites may or may not participate in the various trials that our CRO is running, all right? But that has nothing to do with the physicians that we're gonna actively be recruiting and helping them set up a research clinic, okay? Their business is gonna be their business. We want no equity in it. We're just looking to solve the recruitment problem, okay? So our backbone is our network of home-based CRAs that we've trained. Remember, it's all tying in. This is from the CRA Academy. We now have had several dozen students complete complete their internships. Some have gone on to get hired. Others work for us. Uh, so at current count, we have 44 trained CRAs, three project managers, five medical monitors, and four lead CRAs. Okay, these are typically the positions, the job functions within a CRO. What is missing is clinical trial assistants, um, there are also clinical trial specialists. These are the people who are in charge of doing feasibility process for the research sites. And we're going to get into a little bit of that later. And also the whole data management team, which will be covered in later slides. So we have gone, we find the PIs, right? 
we assign each newly formed physician site their own CRA whose job will be to monitor and help provide the necessary training and operational oversight to ensure that the PI and their study coordinators have a successful first trial. This, to my knowledge, the extent of, of our involvement in this operation has not been done before, okay? Um, now, we've even gone on to the extent of hiring and training study coordinators for the PI or assisting them in hiring an already trained study coordinator. And remember, unlike most CROs, we have a full grasp of what it takes to operate a research site. We also own and operate other research clinics across the country. So we know, we know what we're talking about, okay? We're not just a CRO that has never screened a subject before. Uh, we've done both. We've, we've played on both sides of the coin. All right, so services. We are a full service CRO, and, but however, we understand that many sponsors prefer to choose certain services a la carte. So some sponsors may just need our help with site selection. Other sponsors may just need our help with PI training. Other sponsors may need our help helping them out with patient recruitment. Whatever the case may be, monitoring oversight, we can do it. All right, And full service CROs do all of this and more, which we're going to get into uh, later on in the slides, but those are things such as data analysis, site supply, logistics, investigational product and accountability, and all that other stuff, right? Clinical trial management, setup and monitoring. So we provide monitoring services. This is what makes a CRO a CRO. Now, some sponsors also run their own trials without using CROs and they have their own monitors. So there are still some sponsors out there who do all of this in-house. They haven't outsourced to CROs. Although even those ones who have their own in-house CRAs, they do usually outsource certain aspects of and certain functions of a CRO to a third party, all right? So like I said, we have a, a team of CRAs highly trained, trained by us. These are not people we just hired because we got a gig. These are people we've trained. They're working for our sites. When we don't have projects going on for our CRO, which I hope not to be too much longer, we have them work at our sites, okay, as our in-house CRAs. Recruitment status and trial progress is tracked. Uh, electronic trial master file, ETMF. So. What an ETMF is, think of it as a regulatory binder. If you don't know what a regulatory binder is, go watch my introduction to clinical research video. Uh, every site has a regulatory binder for every study that they participate in. All right, these have forms such as 1572s, the protocols, investigator brochure, protocol signature page, investigator brochure acknowledgement of receipt, uh, all the IRB submissions for that site, uh, financial disclosure forms. I mean, anything that's a regulatory, that's a non-source document is called a regulatory document. Correspondence between the CRA and the site, protocol training log, this is all in there. Now, what, what's a trial master file? Well, a trial master file, think of it as a giant regulatory binder uh, at the CRO level that the CRO manages but it has all the regulatory documents from all the sites participating in that trial, okay? So typically CROs outsource this stuff to third parties. We have exclusive partnerships with a very good vendor who does ETMF, okay? We just started that relationship this year. Um, design, we're able to workshop ideas for your study with our team, all right? Now another function of CRO is statisticians and biostatisticians, all right? These are people that are looking at the trial. You've heard of adaptive trials. Because of the advent of electronic data capture, EDC, and risk-based monitoring, which is looking at the data as it's being entered in real time, you now get the team of biostatisticians in place. They, they, they interact with the data management. They look at the data. They see if the trial needs to be amended. They see if the trial needs to be adapted. Okay, that's called an adaptive trial, right? Uh, there are also risk-based monitoring, which we're gonna get into later on, uh, allows the CRO and it allows us to change our monitoring strategy for each site. So we may know that, hey, this physician in Alabama 
that we just got up and running, this is their first trial. Yes, they have a lot of patience. Their potential is huge as far as the success of their site, but this is their first trial, and they have a relatively inexperienced coordinator. They're going to need more source data verification, and they're going to need much more hands-on hand-holding and hands-on training by our staff, by our CRAs. So we deploy accordingly. We may have another site that has plenty of experience, uh, but maybe they don't have the patient population. Right? So our strategy then will be to help them and to give them resources and, and to give them all the necessary uh, help that they may need to start recruiting successfully and maybe we can share best practices from some of our other sites. Okay, So that's risk-based monitoring. It's basically changing your monitoring plan for each site on the fly as you're getting data and the biostatisticians, they're involved as well when it comes to modifying protocols itself, right? So past performance, okay, we have proven through the past decade of consulting experience that we are able to successfully identify, train, and encourage research-naive physicians to conduct their first clinical research trial while not disrupting their private practice operations. And if they want to keep 100% of the equity in their company, which most do, we let them do that. We're not interested in that. We have plenty of sites that we partner with and we, we get involved financially and we take a piece of the equity. We're not interested in doing that with every site. Okay, We're interested in getting the study on time and under budget. And that means getting the patients from these physicians enrolled in the trial. Right. Um, so we are able to maintain quality control uh, through our CRAs out there, okay? So risk-based monitoring, right? So risk-based monitoring is something everyone's talking about. I mean, if, you're, if you've spent any time Googling or going to any conferences in this industry over the last two years, you had to have heard about risk-based monitoring, right? And it's essentially customizing your monitoring plan for each study based on real-time source data that you're that the sites are putting into the EDC system, as well as safety. So we know what we know what kind of AEs are being reported. We have an idea of which sites are underreporting or perhaps overreporting serious adverse events. We have data. Thanks to big data, we are able to effectively have a risk-based monitoring strategy and a remote monitoring strategy, which the two should not be confused. Uh, for any study that we take on. All right, so risk-based monitoring could be remotely done or risk-based monitoring could be actual on-site monitoring. A lot of people get those two things uh, confused and they often use them as synonyms when they're really not. Risk-based monitoring is a strategy. Remote monitoring means you're actually not physically going to the site. You're monitoring through our virtual workspace from home, the site is uploading their source documents to the cloud. With us, it's through Intralinks via. So we can do both, depending on what the sponsor wants and depending on what makes sense for the trial. Okay, so don't get those two confused. Data management, okay? So a typical CRO, especially a full service CROs, they're gonna have everything set up. Obviously the EDC, the CRF design, which is the EDC, case report form, and electronic data capture are the same thing. Rarely anyone uses paper EDCs anymore. It's all electronic data capture. All right, get your database set up, your, uh, your certified staff. I mean, these are the, all the data management, okay? You've got data managers. You've got people who are looking at the queries. You've got algorithms that are automatically assigning queries when sites enter data. And then you've got human beings who go in there and look at things that may not make sense as far as what's in the EDC and issue a query. Also, monitors can issue queries when they go on site or when they're monitoring remotely uh, because they understand the protocol, right? Statistics. So every CRO is going to have a statistics uh uh, component to their services, all right, and this could be biostatistics, usually it is, all right, and this is all for safety reporting and primarily uh, to present the safety data to the FDA when the trial is complete and ready to be presented, which 
most CROs actually do this as well with the sponsors. All right, medical and scientific writing. This comes down to the protocols, also the FDA submissions or the regulatory submissions. Uh, you need to have medical and scientific writers. Every CRO is going to have this. Uh, it could be the medical monitor as well, but typically it's someone who specializes specifically in protocol writing, right? So it's usually a PhD and also submitting data to regulatory bodies such as the FDA, which would typically be an attorney. Um, some of you may know Darshan Kulkarni, who we actually work with. Um, he he uh, this is one of the things he does okay is fda submissions so pharmacovigilance okay this is this is looking at the safety of the study drug as the trial is going on right typically you have a data safety monitoring board you have the medical monitors involved so as adverse events are being reported and entered in the edc and especially as serious adverse events are being reported to the IRBs, you've got pharmacovigilance team in place and they're making sure that, number one, that the patients who are involved in the trials, that their safety is being looked out for. Number two, does the protocol need to be amended? Uh, does the protocol need to be adapted at all? And then they're, they're keeping track of all this data so that they can send it off to the regulatory body when the trial's over, okay? QA and auditing, sometimes, because the job of a CRO is, of course, to provide quality assurance for the study being conducted at their sites. And this is done by having CRAs go out to the sites. But sometimes you need a third party auditor to audit the work of your own CRAs. OK, so it's not considered ethical if you send your own QA team to audit your CRAs, although some sponsors do typically or some CROs do. Typically, a sponsor would prefer that a third party group get involved when it comes to quality assurance and quality control of the CRO itself. Okay, so this is where that comes in. Uh, these are the therapeutic areas. So you have some CROs that specialize in just about everything, others that are very niche. We actually prefer the more difficult trials because we can find the physicians who have those patients. First of all, most CROs don't want those difficult trials. We'll take them because we found what works. We found we have a proven system that works, at least at the site level. And so scaling it up to multiple sites, which is, by the way, what we've done anyways with our consulting and the sites that we own, uh, it, it's a challenge we're looking forward to. And I think that uh, solving the patient recruitment problem starts with the, the principal investigators and the physicians. And most of the time, they're going to be research naive. Okay. So here's more about the team that we have, and most CROs are going to have much bigger um, workforce of CRAs. Ours is about 44, three project managers. I mean, when you look at some of these big ones, they've got tens of thousands. Okay, standards. So you know you've got to follow ICH GCP. You've got to follow the regulatory mandates of the regulatory bodies in whatever country it is that your sites are conducting research in. I mean, that's common sense. Okay, and then the experience, all right? So that's what a CRO is. And hopefully this slide was able to clarify some of that for you guys. And if it wasn't, don't worry, I'll keep making more videos. So hopefully, little by little, you can just start slowly understanding the inner workings of a CRO, what that entails, and you can sort of see how my CRO evolves over time. Okay, so I'm going to keep you all posted regularly. Make sure you subscribe to YouTube. Make sure you check out my CRO page, which you can find from my blog, theclinicaltrialsguru.com, uh, or you can just go to dscssweatequity.com. And I'll have the links underneath this video as well. All right. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon.